All right, how's everybody doing today? Hotep, hey, this is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecture writer, and historian. So it is Saturday, uh, September 3rd, uh, 2022, and we are live. So I wanted to come on um, for a few minutes and talk about, uh, give you a preview of the online class that I'm uh, teaching on. Uh, this is going to start up Thursday, September 8th, 2022, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You heard me talk about, and we're going to give you information on that. So we do a thousands of year history, and we do what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade uh, taking place. And I do a PowerPoint presentation. We have book references, articles, video clips. We have all that um, in the class, okay? So you never look at history uh the same way okay so everybody share this broadcasting on social media platforms and uh I invite your friends to tune in also all right and we're broadcasting on our facebook fan page the african history network the african history network and our youtube channel michael m hotep i m h o t e p uh also okay so when we uh deal with the transatlantic slave trade we have to understand that um African people have been in the land we call the United States of America going back thousands of years. So we can't start our history in 1619. We can't start in 1555. We can't start in 1526 with the Spanish taking um, Africans into the territory uh, we call uh, South Carolina and Georgia. We have to deal with thousands of years of history that leads up to all of that uh taking place all right and i'm going to bring up the powerpoint presentation here and we have information here in the thread of the broadcast on how to register uh for the class okay and as soon as you register also this bonus content that you can start watching um also all right uh well the clotilda was just found jacqueline i don't know where you've been um people don't ask where is the nina the penta the santa maria or the mayflower but they asked where the slave ships are. But the clo research the Clotilda because they found the Clotilda. Um, I, I wish people do more research. All right. So let's look at this here. And I've been teaching this class on and off since uh, 2017. Uh, we can't start studying our history in slavery even when we study the transatlantic slave trade, which is important to study, we can't start in 1619. We know we just had the 403rd uh, anniversary of August uh, 20th, 1619. Um, the, uh, so we just had the 403rd anniversary of August 20th, 1619. And I actually did a broadcast dealing with that as well. And um, even though 1619 is important to study, um, a lot of times 1619 gets uh, overemphasized, okay, because there were African people uh, here in this country going back tens of thousands of years ago. So one of the things that's important to understand is this um, chronology of history, all right? So let's continue here. Um, we can't start in the 1440s with the Portuguese. We know the Portuguese get involved in 1441. Uh, we have to understand the history chronologically and deal with the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors, um, who entered the Iberian Peninsula today, known as Spain and Portugal uh, from North Africa in 711 AD. And they go through uh, Morocco in 711 AD. They go in originally 710 under General Tarif, and then they go in in 711 AD to conquer and fight against the Vandals and the Visigoths. Now, this course not only deals with the transatlantic slave trade, but thousands of years of history that leads up to the, uh, the transatlantic slave trade of African people taking place. August 20th, uh, 2019 marked the 400th year anniversary of the 29 Africans who come into uh, Point Comfort uh, on August 20, 1619, on the White Lion pirate ship, which was an English pirate ship, okay? And these were the uh, um, 
Kumbundu uh, speaking people uh, from um, present day Angola. They were captured. They were actually captured by Portuguese slave ship, uh, the San Juan Batista. Okay, the Portuguese slave ship had about 350 Africans on it, and they're going to be hijacked by two English uh, pirate ships, the White Lion and the Treasurer. And the White Lion and the Treasurer, they come into Virginia in uh, August of 1619, and they're there in uh, Point Comfort, Virginia, which was Hampton. It wasn't Jamestown, it was at Hampton, Virginia. Now, the year of 2019 was known as the year of return, so that 400th year anniversary. As many African Americans uh, reconnected to Africa and traveled to Ghana and other West African countries. When we discuss the transatlantic slave trade, we have to first understand that African people are the original people of North, Central, and South America and have been in the land uh, we call the United States at least 51,700 51, years ago. And one of the books that we use in the class is uh, The First Americans Were Africans Documented Evidence by Dr. David M. Hotel. Uh, who's a friend of mine, and we and his book documents the African presence in this country going back thousands of years. So we deal with everything from the 800-year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors. We deal with shocking archaeological discoveries that are causing experts to rethink everything, insurance companies that took out insurance policies on slave ships and enslaved Africans on plantations, um, Freemasonry, America and the Founding Fathers, origins of the term America and Africa, uh, we look at what was the transatlantic slave trade and what leads up to it taking place. We, we deal with the role of Christopher Columbus plays. We look at people like Bartholomew de las Casas, right? Reverend Bishop Bartholomew de las Casas, who traveled on voyages with Columbus as well. And he's going to actually push for uh, Africans primarily, but also some white people to be enslaved instead of Native Americans, because he said the Native Americans have suffered enough and they were trying to uh, save the Native American souls. Okay, so you have uh, right Reverend Bishop Bartholomew de las Casas to thank for that. Now he's going to um, fight against the transatlantic slave trade after that, but it really, after the um, Asiento of uh, 1518 and, and King Charles V of Spain, who's the king of Spain at, the, at that time, the, the, the Asiento de Negros is going to drastically expand the transatlantic slave trade. Okay, and so some sources that you look at will have the transatlantic slave trade starting in uh, 1518, which is which is not correct, but they're looking at, they, they may refer to it as a transatlantic slave trade proper uh, because in 1518, when, when uh, with the, with the Spanish involvement in the transatlantic slave trade, the um, the Africans are not going from Africa into Spain first. They're going from Africa directly to uh, where they're going in the Spanish colonies, as opposed to stopping in Spain first. Um, and we talk about the Asiento de Negros um, in the class because that is a important turning point in the transatlantic slave trade. That's even before the triangular trade um, was created. The triangular trade is going to largely be uh, created and championed and used by the English. Okay, where well, the English get involved in the transatlantic slave trade in 1562. When you look at this one here, when you look at this um, um, chart here, or this, this graphic here, with the transatlantic slave trade, they, they look at from, say, 1650 to 1860, okay? Well, it's already been going on for 200 years at this point, 1650. You'll see some other ones. I have some other ones that look at it starting in 1518, all right? Well, uh, 1518 is, you know, 60-some odd years after it starts. Starts in 1441, right about right about 1441 with the Portuguese and Anton Gonzalez going into um, uh, Mauritania and picking up uh, 12 Africans. All right, so we'll look at things like uh, work from Dr. David M. Hotep and uh, archeological discoveries that show an African presence uh, in this country dating back at least 51,700 years ago. 
um, in page 14 of his book, he deals with the discovery from uh, Dr. Albert Goodyear in uh, 2004, where they, uh, in Allendale County, South Carolina, they found 13 different types of evidence that thoroughly documented an African presence in this country dating back at least 51,700 years ago, okay? And um, they found art artifacts, architecture, campsites, footprints in lava, genetic M174 haploid groups dealing with DNA and genetics. They found um, skulls, uh, skull skeleton structures and tools, uh, 13 different types of evidence thoroughly documenting the African presence in this country dating back at least 51,700 years ago. Here's a picture of Dr. Albert Goodyear, and there was a, a, a good article from ScienceDaily.com that deals with um, uh, his discovery from uh, 2004. And there's still um, dispute over his discovery. So the established the archaeological establishment um, disputes his discovery. And what happens is when a lot of these uh, archaeological discoveries are made, they keep having to push the timelines back. There's, there's one that came out of Morocco in 2017 of uh, Homo sapien uh, skeletal remains that date back between 300,000 and 350,000 years ago which was over 100,000 years older than the oldest uh, human remains that they had, which was found in Ethiopia uh, about 1974 or so. And that dates back about 195,000 years ago, okay? Well, the discovery in Morocco, when you read about that, and we, we deal with this in the class, when you read about that, uh, they say that they that it, this is totally changing everything and they have to push the timelines back and they have to rethink everything and rethink um migration out of east africa much sooner than they originally thought uh and you know so this is causing that when these discoveries happen they cause the history books to be rewritten as well so uh these are some of the types of things uh that we deal with uh in the course okay and I'm teaching another session of it on uh, Sunday, September 3rd. So when you register for the class, you'll you register for our new class. We have the information at our website, um, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com or TheAfricanHistoryNetwork.com. But you can join us for the session we're doing on Sunday, uh, September 4th, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, because that's a that's a class that is wrapping up. We only have two sessions left in the class. So you're going to get that as a bonus when you register for the new course. The new course actually starts up Thursday, uh, September 8th, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. But you, you're you going to get these two sessions, the session that I'm doing on, on Sunday, September 4th, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You're going to get that as a bonus. Okay, so uh, the name of this article here is New Evidence Puts Man in North America 50,000 Years Ago. It's from ScienceDaily.com. And Sci ScienceDaily.com is a scientific website. They have different scientific discoveries and archaeological discoveries and things like that at, at ScienceDaily.com. It says um, radiocarbon uh, radiocarb tests of carbonized plant remains where artifacts were unearthed last May along the Savannah River in Allendale County uh, by University of South Carolina archaeologist Dr. Albert Goodyear indicate that the sediments containing these artifacts are at least 50,000 years old, meaning that humans inhabited North America long before the last ice age, meaning that humans inhabited North America long before the last ice age. All right. And I'm going to actually post a link here so you can register for the full uh, course also. Now, these humans that are talking about are the Khoisan. The Khoisan have the oldest DNA on the planet. They um, are the ancestors to the Ainu and the Twa. They go all around the world. Uh, these are the short statute Africans. They were here in the land we call the United States of America also. So uh, an October 2012 genetic study published in Science Magazine found that the, that the Khoisan in Southern Africa 
are the oldest ethnic group of modern humans. This, the Khoisan in Southern Africa are the oldest ethnic group of modern humans uh, with their ancestral line originating about 100,000 years ago. Uh, the Khoisan, formerly called by the derogatory term Bushmen, are genetically unique and no other currently known population had separated so early from our from our common modern human ancestor, according to the report. Now here are a couple of uh, Khoisan women. Okay. And the Khoisan live mainly in uh, Southern Africa in territory spanning uh, Namibia, Angola, Zambia, Zimbabwe, um, and South Africa. And let me pull this up here so I can post the, okay, it's coming up. So I can post the link. We have the link also here in the thread of the broadcast. Uh, they are largely divided into two groups, uh, hunters and gatherers known as the Sans people and keepers of livestock known as the Khoi Khoi people. Uh, the Khoisan languages include the distinctive clicks, the, the distinctive click sounds, the click language that are that are not found in the languages of their neighbors. OK, and there's a good article from Atlanta Blackstar dot com uh, five ethnic groups that prove the first humans were black, five ethnic groups that prove uh, the first humans were black. So we deal with. Uh, a lot of these different ancient um, uh, civilizations, okay? We deal with the Khoisan, we deal with Nubia, ancient Kemet. We look at archaeological discoveries. We deal with Great Zimbabwe also. This discovery here, um, 2010, February 15, 2010, you have this article from the New York Times, okay? On Crete, new evidence of very ancient mariners, on Crete, new evidence of very ancient mariners. And this uh, is from February 15th, 2010. Uh, stone tools on the Greek island of Crete, uh, found on the Greek island of Crete, over the course of uh, two summers, they did these excavations. Archaeologists say are at least 130,000 years old, at least 130,000 years old. Uh, which is considered strong evidence for the earliest known seafaring in the Mediterranean and calls for rethinking the maritime capabilities of pre-human cultures, okay? So when we look at these discoveries, we see that the deeper they dig, the blacker the planet gets, and the more research they do, the older we get, okay? And these archaeological discoveries are causing the archaeologists, the paleontologists, the um, scientists, all of them, to, to totally rethink everything and challenge a lot of their um, beliefs that have stood in place for decades, okay, when it comes to uh, archaeology, when it comes to um, human history, different things like this, okay? All this is being challenged. All right, let's continue here. Now, Crete has been an island for more than 5 million years. Um, Crete has been an island for more than 5 million years, meaning that the tool makers must have arrived by boat. So this seems to push the history of Mediterranean voyaging back more than 100,000 years, specialists in Stone Age archaeology say. Previous artifact discoveries has shown people reaching Cyprus, a few other Greek islands, and possibly Sardinia, no earlier than 10,000 to 12,000 years ago. No earlier than 10,000 to 12,000 years ago. Even more intriguing, the archaeologists uh, who found the tools on Crete noted the style of the hand axe be up to 700,000 years. Now, they may be a stretch. They, they admit it. But the tools resemble from the stone technology known as Eshulin. It's, it's spelled A-C-H-U-L-E-A-N. 
Echelon, dated with pre-human populations in Africa, somewhere between 150,000 years ago to 1.5 million years ago. Okay, so now, you know, I've been talking about this discovery for a number of years in uh, on my radio shows and things like this. So I had somebody respond to me on my YouTube channel, and they had not read the entire article or something like that. And they said, uh, oh, they found a couple of stone tools, and now they're trying to say that Africans are this old or trying to make this claim, blah, blah, blah. No, they found more than 2,000 stone artifacts, including the hand axes, were collected on the southwestern shore of Crete over the course of two summers. They found more than 2,000 stone artifacts. It wasn't one or two. They're not making that they're not making this determination based upon one or two artifacts that were found. They found more than 2,000 stone artifacts over the course of, of, of two summers, okay? So it's important for us to read this information as well. We look at the uh, discovery of the lost city of Egypt. Now, they're, 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 now there are two lost city, cities of Egypt that we talk about in the class, okay? This one right here, this discovery was revealed in 2013 because when you research it, they had already made the discovery years before that. Okay. They, okay. Hold on. The screen was frozen up. Okay. So this discovery here of Tanis Heraklion, the lost city of Egypt, this discovery was revealed in 2013. When you research it, you'll see that they made the discovery prior to 2013 but they actually revealed what it was that they found in april of 2013 okay now there are two lost cities of egypt that we'll talk about in the class one is thomas heraklion and the other one is uh called dazzling at named after akhenaten uh who was amenhotep the fourth all right and that discovery of a uh, dazzling Aten that came out in uh, 2021. And that's a lost city that dates back about 3,400 years ago, something like that. Okay. So if we look at this here, uh, let me close this window out. Why is this coming up? Hold on just a second here. All right. So how you all like this type of information? Give us a thumbs up. Give us a heart. Give us a like on the broadcast. I'm trying to see why is this freezing up? Hold on. All right. So here's some of the artifacts that were discovered at the bottom of the sea. Um, so this is done with Tanis Heraklion, and it says, uh, this comes from an article from uh, Yahoo News. Now, the other articles dealing with this, other publications had articles dealing with this. I cited uh, the article from Yahoo News. They picked up this story from The Telegraph, which is a United Kingdom publication. Okay, sunken uh, Egyptian city reveals 1200 year old secret sunken egyptian city reveals 1200 year old secret uh secrets uh the telegraph reports that 150 feet beneath the surface of egypt's bay of abu Kir, they found 64 ships 16 foot tall statues 700 anchors anchors countless gold coins and smaller artifacts uh now the lead archaeologist was Frank Gadillo on this expedition. Frank Gadillo estimates that Tanis Heraklion was built around 8th century BC. Okay, so and these are some of the statues that they found, some of the artifacts, just a few of other things that they found down there. All right. Um, and then we look at the uh, the lost city of Egypt as well. Uh, this is dealing with Dazzling Aten. 
also. So we go throughout and look at different periods of history. Of course, we deal with the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors. Um, and then we, we look at the African influence here uh, on the U.S. as well, okay, which is extremely important also, uh, the African influence on the U.S. Uh, the layout of Washington, D.C. is a copy of uh, the layout of uh, ancient Kemet. And Egypt on the Potomac, uh, but Tony Browder deals with this as well, okay? Um And Egypt on the Potomac is one of the books that we reference in the class also. Now, here is the Washington Monument. The Washington Monument um, is called a Tekken. Uh, well, the Greeks called it obelisk, but it's actually a Tekken. It's an ancient African symbol. Uh, it's a symbol for resurrection coming from the uh, story of Asar, Aset, and Heru who the Greeks called Osiris, Isis, and Horus. Uh, and we know that Freemasonry, the foundation of Freemasonry are the teachings coming out of ancient Kemet, coming out of the Grand Lodges in ancient Kemet, coming out of the temples. So there were over 1,200 Tekanu in ancient Kemet. Today there are somewhere, but there's less than a dozen of them, okay? Let's put it like this. It's less than a dozen of them. Uh, I'm going to post a link here to uh, register for the courses, uh, register for the course. And we need some bonus content that you'll get as well. So you can register for that. Now we do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch anytime. And also we have the information on the homepage of our website, uh, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. And let me pull up the, uh, we've got the uh, website up here. If you go to our old website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, it'll, it'll direct you to the new website. So this, from, it's from this information here. So the class is going to be an eight-week online course. I've been teaching it on and off since 2017. Um, we, ha we have uh, over 150 slides. Uh, in the class, uh, so with 50 articles, I do a PowerPoint presentation. We have book references, articles, video clips. So class number one begins uh, Thursday, September 8th, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So you can register here. Click right here to register. And uh, you can do debit card, credit card, PayPal, uh, um, et cetera. And also when you register, you'll see the information for the class on Sunday, September 4th, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, because we have two sessions left of a uh, course that's already been running that I'm wrapping up. So you can join us for the existing course and you'll be ready for class number one that starts up Thursday, September 8th. All right. Now. We see different Tekkens um, in different parts of the world. OK, and we see this theft of African history, African culture, and it gets represented to the world as if these people uh, created it, created it themselves. And they did not as if Europeans created this themselves and they did not. Um, we see uh, examples of Tekkens in uh, or Tekken New, Tekken New for plural in London, England, New York City, right here in the U.S., New York City and Paris, France. Now, eight, the ancient Kemites or ancient Egyptians called obelisks Tekkenu. You'll see Tekkenu spelled differently, uh, different ways. Sometimes that last letter will be a W instead of a U. But ancient Egyptians called obelisk Tekkenu, and they, they were also used to tell the time um, in the past. Now, their pinnacles were basically covered in gold to reflect the sunlight. Historians say that um, obelisks represented immortality and eternity. They represented immortality and eternity. And their long structure uh, helped connect the heavens and the earth. Now, currently, Cleopatra's needle is the name given to three ancient Egyptian 
Tekken, Tekken New or Obelisks. One in New York City, one in London, England, and one in Paris, France. However, they do not all come from one Egyptian site. The obelisks in New York and London are carved out of red granite from the quarries of Aswan, a major source of stone for Egyptian antiquities. The two obelisks were commissioned by Pharaoh uh, or Nesubiti uh, Thutmose III for the Temple of the Sun in Heliopolis near modern day Cairo, uh, with each weighing about 224 tons and they're 68 feet tall. So there was a good article from face to face Africa.com called Cleopatra's Needle, how three ancient Egyptian obelisks ended up in New York City, London, and Paris, France. But what happens is is we'll see these structures, right? And not know that these structures are from Africa. They were created by African people. They're from the Nile Valley region of Africa. So we'll give credit to the country uh, where they are. So we'll give credit to the French. You know, we'll give credit to uh, Europeans here in the U.S. and New York City because we think that they created them. But no, these were stolen. These were stolen from our ancestors. So we look at things like some of the uh, deity, uh, especially in ancient Kemet, and we look at the first holy trinity uh, uh, known as Asar, Aset, and Heru, who the Greeks called Osiris, Isis, and Horus. And we look at some of the mythology surrounding them, the, the, and that mythology is still with us today, okay? Uh, so here's a famous statue of Asar, Aset, and Heru. Heru is in the middle. I'm sorry. Asar is in the middle. The father, Asar, is in the middle, who he's called Osiris. Now, if you look at page 17 of Egypt on the Potomac by Tony Browder, and that's one of the books we use in the class. You don't have to buy any of these books to follow along in the class. We share excerpts with you. Um, you can buy them if you want to, but you don't have to buy any of these books to be able to follow along in the class. Now, there were approximately 1,200 Tekkenu, uh built in ancient Kemet in ancient times, but only about a dozen are found in Egypt today. Many of the Tekkenu removed from Egypt are now in Istanbul, Turkey, London, England, Paris, France, Berlin, Germany, New York, New York, Rome, Italy, Vatican City, and elsewhere throughout the world. The, the Tekkenu are now called obelisks by their new owners, and few people know their origin or that they symbolize the resurrection of the African king or Nesubiti or Pharaoh Asar. If you read page 17 of Egypt on the Potomac by uh, Tony Browder, he breaks down this history. All right, so this is uh, some of the type of information we deal with. We look at the Black Madonna and Child coming from Osar, Osset, and Heru, coming from Osset and Heru. The Greeks call them Isis and Horus. Heru was the, the, the first Kabrest or Christ because the word Christ comes from Christos, which means anointed, which comes from the Kemetic Kabrest, which means the rising of the spirit, Kam meaning spirit, rest meaning to rise. And we see in the mythology that um, Asar, after he is killed, uh, Asar is, uh, is resurrected after he is killed by his brother Set. He's cut up into 14 pieces. 13 of those pieces are recovered. And um, we see that uh, he, uh, Asar is going to be resurrected. Uh, or Set puts the uh, 13 pieces that are recovered back together and, and resurrects her husband and the, uh, his death is going to be avenged by his son, um, Heru, uh, who kills, uh, Heru kills his uncle Set, okay? And we see that this is also going to form the foundation of the movie Star Wars because George Lucas was a big, uh, he studied mythology. His mentor was um, Joseph Campbell. Joseph Campbell wrote the book, The Power of Myth. And in an interview that Bill Moyers did in 1999 with George Lucas, who created Star Wars, 
George Lucas talks about the power of myth. He talks about the impact that uh, Joseph Campbell had on him and the mythology that Joseph Campbell shared with him. Uh, the mythology of Star Wars with George Lucas, the, the struggle between heroes and villains and the influence of a higher force are the essence of mythology and resonate within all cultures, providing storytellers with a natural framework for spinning tales. Okay, so we look, we'll look at things like Freemasonry. Um, the word Mason is derived from the Latin words mass and sun. Mason means child of light and expresses the desire to pursue light, which is a metaphor for the sun, which symbolizes knowledge. The term child of light or sons and daughters of light was first used to identify students who had completed 42 years of study in the uh, temples of ancient Kemet, 42 years of study in the temples of ancient Kemet. Many uh, Masonic temples. Now, right here in Detroit, we have something called the Masonic Temple. My graduation, my high school graduation was was held there like 30 years, over 30 years ago, close to in 1989, 1989. It was held at the Masonic Temple here in Detroit, which was in the Cass Corridor. Um, the term child of light or sons and daughters of light, S-U-N-S, sons and daughters of light, because women were allowed to study these teachings also, was first used to identify students who had completed 42 years of study in the temples of ancient Kemet. Many Masonic temples were modeled after the temples of ancient Kemet, places where light or knowledge was imparted in a series of steps or degrees. Light or knowledge was, imp uh, was imparted in a series of steps or degrees. So the concept of going to um, a college or an institution of higher learning and getting your credentials in a series of steps or degrees or in a series of degrees, this comes from Africa. This comes from ancient Africa. So you get your associate's degree, you get your bachelor's degree, your master's degree, your PhD. OK, that's it. That's an ancient concept and the concept of liberal arts colleges comes out of it comes out of the Nile, Nile Valley region of Africa as well. Um, it, it, George G.M. James in his book Stolen Legacy deals with the seven liberal arts and the arithmetic and the rhetoric and the logic and things like this. OK, so all this is African. We, we, we have been stripped of African history and culture and, and taught to see reality through the eyes of, of Europeans and not understanding where a lot of these things that are around us come from. This is why it's in the class, you know, we use a, um, a uh, symbols encyclopedia, okay? A symbols encyclopedia, which is important to use. Uh, and the reason why is, is because we have to learn how to decode uh, these different symbols that are all around us. So a symbols encyclopedia is, uh, is, is very, very important. And I'll show you the one that I use here in just a second. Um, let me pull this up here. So you don't have to use this one. There, there are, you know, many others that you can, but I was able to get this, um, uh, I bought this some years ago at, uh, I think it was Barnes Borders Bookstore. I think it was Borders Bookstore. I got it at, it was like $10 uh, when I got it. Okay, hold on. All right. Okay, so I'm going to monitor this here on YouTube also. All right, so this is the uh, signs and symbols is the name of it. So this one right here, signs and symbols. So this is the um, symbols dictionary, symbols encyclopedia that I use. And it's in full color. 
when you open it up, the first page, it has Heru on it. Straight out of ancient Kemet. Okay. You look at the cover, you see symbols from the metal netter on it. You see a pyramid. You'll see the caduceus, which is the universal symbol of medicine that comes out of Africa. That comes from the staff of Dehuti. Um, and Dehuti carried uh, two staffs, and it, each staff had a snake wrapped around it. And one staff had the crown of Upper Kemet on it. The, the other staff had the crown of Lower Kemet. And then you're going to have um, uh, Hermes, which was worshipped by the Greeks, the deity of the Greeks. Hermes has a has a staff that's similar to the one that the Houthi has, the two that the Houthi has. And then Mercury, who's worshipped by the Romans, he's going to have the symbol of the Caduceus, which is a combination of of what Hermes had in, in uh, Dehuti, okay? So when you see the universal symbol of medicine, you're looking at African symbolism, okay? We look at the Eye of Heru here as well. And then we look at the back, you see African symbols also on the back, okay? Uh, also, oh, in the middle here, you see the Ankh, the African symbol of eternal life, or the African or the African key of life, the Ankh, A N K A A N K H, and we know these temples where the learning, the teaching was taking place in ancient Kemet. The temples were called Per Ankh, okay, the House of Life. So we see Africa on the front and back, and then uh, we open it up and we see, you know, it's full. It's a full color. Um, all the pages, the pictures, all this is full color. Okay, and it goes through, it, de it decodes, explains over uh, 2,000 uh, symbols from all around the world. Decode the secrets and uncover the origins and meanings of over 2,000 signs and symbols from ancient hieroglyphs to modern day logos. From ancient hieroglyphs to modern day logos. Okay, so... This one was, uh, I think this was $10 or something like that. This is put out by, this is put out by Covent, Covent Garden Books. It's put out by Covent Garden Books. Okay. That's the publisher. And this is Signs and Symbols. So there may be other, um, symbols encyclopedias you get this one this edition came out in 2011 there may be other uh, symbols encyclopedias that you get but you want to you definitely want to have one like this right here this deals with royalty and decoding let me see, can we get this here? This deals with royalty and decoding symbols of royalty from different cultures. We see the uh, sarcophagi here, the pharaoh. This is sarcophagi of uh, Tutankhamun, King Tut, right here. All right, so we have to be able to uh, decode the symbols that are all around us. This is a really good one because it, there's a um, index in the back, so it makes looking up information easy. The index is really small. I mean, but um, the index is really small, but uh, they do have one. All right. All right, let's continue here. How's everybody doing? Okay, how you all like this information? Who, who still needs to register for this uh, online course? And when you register for our new eight-week online class, 
that meets on uh, class number one is going to be Thursday, September 8th, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. When you register for that, you'll also get the uh, last two sessions of a, uh, of a course that is coming to an end that I'm teaching. And we have the next session of that course on Sunday, September 4th, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So you'll be when you register for this new course that starts up, you'll be able to join me in the uh, for the session on Saturday, on Sunday, September 4th, uh, 2022, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So we have the link here in the thread of the broadcast. So you can register for uh, the class. All right, now Masonic temples are considered houses of light or temples of learning. The term Mason or child of light is a direct response, uh, a direct reference to the uh, highest degree of the comedic education system, the highest degree of the comedic education system. The 33 degrees of instruction within Masonry represent a fraction of the 360 degrees of instruction that comprised the uh, comedic system of education, yet, le yet with less than 10% of the wisdom of ancient Kemet, Freemasons have held positions of influence and power throughout the world for over 200 years. So you look at page 33 of Egypt on the Potomac by Tony Browder. He deals with that type of information. So then we 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 will look at the Black Madonna and Child, which is important to really understand because Europeans are worshiping the Black Madonna and Child even before um, the Moors go in in 711 AD. And the statues of the Black Madonna and Child still throughout Europe today. And you'll see, um, and from the Black Madonna and Child, then we get the decolorized version of the white Mary and Jesus. Once the once you have a rise in the uh, in European powers and they're coming out of the Dark Ages, um, and you go into the 1400s, they're starting to conquer people's lands. Uh, the Moors are losing control in Europe. Then what you're going to see is you're going to see a rise in the uh, European phenotype as you see a rise in European powers, um, you're going to see traditional images that were African reinterpreted as European. And one of them is going to be the Madonna and child um, and images, images of God and th different things like this. You're going to see interpreted as European. So Michelangelo paints, paints the Sistine Chapel and he uses his aunt and uncle as the models for Adam and Eve. Okay. And he paints God as a European. He paints the angels as white, etc. All right. So this is the, the Sphinx, what the Greeks called the Sphinx, which is really Haramaket or Heru on the horizon. So we'll go through and look at different things like this. We'll look at um, Joie de Piet, Black Pete who is in reference to the Moors and was, and we see the celebration of uh, Black Pete, Joie de Piet in November and December in the Netherlands. Um, and it runs through about December 5th uh, in the Netherlands, but he is a, um, he, he, uh, he is a Moor that is a servant in some in some versions of the story it says a slave to uh center class and center class was a, a religious figure in uh, amongst the dutch okay now center class in dutch means saint nicholas and you see center class with the long white beard and the red and white cape his colors, he wore red and white. He's a precursor to Santa Claus, okay? Santa Claus means St. Nicholas. And the when the Dutch come to this country in the early 1700s, they bring the celebration of center class with them. 
and center class gets transformed into the secular figure of Santa Claus. Now it's going to be the uh, cartoonist, a cartoonist named Thomas Nast, N-A-S-T. Thomas Nast is going to be the one who transforms center class into the secular figure of the jolly fellow, the jolly fat fellow in the red suit known as Santa Claus. That transformation is going to be basically done by Thomas Nast. Then you have um, the um, poem, um, A Visit from St. Nicholas by uh, the Reverend Clement Clark Moore. Uh, Twas the night before Christmas and all through the house, not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. That's from Clement Clark Moore. And that story is is uh, also helps to push the um, the secular figure Santa Claus and it introduces the reindeer also. OK, but we're going to see that that those stories in Santa Claus that comes from largely the Netherlands and amongst the Dutch. But we're going to see the dehumanization of the Moors practice in this celebration because there's a parade that they that takes place throughout the Netherlands. And you have Europeans who dress up as um who, who dress up as a uh, black Pete and they put on black face and um they put on black face and they uh, put on red lipstick uh and, and wear afro wigs to imitate black pete okay joie de pied. now over the past i would say probably about the past 10 years and especially in the past couple of years because of the killing of george floyd in the international um meant uh towards like social justice and racial justice but pretty much over about the past 10 years there has been an increase in press surrounding the um celebration in the parade of, of joie de piet okay so this article right here from washington post Center class and joie de piet. Why, why a holiday has me talking to my kids about blackface. Center class and joie de piet. Why a holiday has me talking to my kids about blackface. This is from December 4th, 2018 by Tracy Brown Hamilton. So here you see the, uh, this is part of the parade, okay? And you have this uh it's supposed to be a steamship and you have these europeans dressed up in blackface as uh black pete and then you see center class there in the middle right okay so if we look uh quickly here at this article uh, um it says the tradition is this on the second Saturday of November, Joie de Piet, or Black Pete, arrives in the Netherlands, arrives in the Netherlands on a steamship from where? From Spain, on a steamship from Spain. Where, where, and that's where the Moors go into in 711 AD. It was called the Iberian Peninsula back then, but it's, it was basically Spain and Portugal arrives in the Netherlands on a steamboat from Spain along with center class, a towering, thin, and plushly dressed figure. Hundreds of people gather to watch the steamboat arrive. Hundreds of people gather to watch the steamboat arrive with Piet's dancing and waving while brass, while brass band music plays until center class disembarks on the white horse with Joaquin de Piet's walking at his side to greet and offer treats to the children. The ritual repeats in various 
uh, cities across the Netherlands until December 5th, the name day of St. Nicholas. December 5th, the name day of St. Nicholas. Now, Joie de Piet is, according to folklore, an assistant to center class and of Moorish descent an assistant to center class and of Moorish descent. So part of the mythology is that he is a servant and some sources say a slave to center class. And this is part of the dehumanization and part of the mythology surrounding conquering the Moors, defeating the Moors. Okay. And then this gets incorporated into uh, European, uh, folklore and children's stories and European culture. Okay. Like Blackamore jewelry. We'll talk about Blackamore jewelry in the class in that Blackamore jewelry. Oftentimes Blackamore jewelry and Blackamore uh, art and statues oftentimes depicts the Moors as being servants. Okay. Which is another part of the symbolism of showing that they were conquered. Now, traditionally since, Joie de Piet's first appearance in a children's book in 1850. So you so you can introduce th these dehumanizing images uh, in stories to children to and what this does is this really pro programs how they see African people and it conditions them to see African people as being subservient and being conquered and things like this. So traditionally, since Piet's first appearance in a children's book in 1850, Joie de Piet uh, is portrayed as very dark skinned, portrayed as, very dark, as a very dark skinned character with large red lips. Joie de Piet is portrayed as a very dark skinned character with large, large red lips curly black hair and giant hoop earrings so these europeans will put on afro wigs okay and put on lipstick okay red lipstick and let me see we see it, um if we can see it here you see them with the red lipstick on afro wigs black face this is going on right now this happens now and then we're going to see this you um it, between november and december usually each year you'll see stories about this taking place in the netherlands and you'll see story protests taking place because every year between november and december i see stories dealing with this now when joanta piets appear in person they are portrayed by volunteers in blackface unlike santa claus who comes one night a year, center class and Joie de Piet stick around for a few weeks, leaving presents uh, for children's shoes left out by the fireplace each night. Okay, now, um, but we are, we, are, we are also inundated with news of protests and riots among those in favor of the Joie de Piet tradition and those who wish to end it. And discourse between Dutch politicians and international bodies, such as the United Nations Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, which urged the Netherlands to put an end to racial stereotypes and blackface, okay, is less joyful. All right, let's see here. Okay, so you can read the rest of this here. But once again, this ties into some of the history of the Moors. And we see, we're going to see examples of, de of dehumanization of African people that becomes entertainment for Europeans. We're going to see examples of this, uh, you know, in various countries, but also here in the U.S. Like the, like the minstrel shows. Of, uh, of which start about 1828 with T.D. Rice, Thomas Dartmouth Rice here in the U.S. and become one of the most, uh, at one time, pretty much probably about the most popular form of entertainment in the country. Okay, let's continue here. 
All right, how do y'all like this type of information? Who still needs to register for this online class? So we have a new course starting up uh, Thursday, September 8th, 2022, 7 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's going to be a uh, eight-week online course. Now, I'm teaching a uh, – I have a um, – I have a uh, section of this course that's coming to an end. We have two classes left. Uh, the next class I'm teaching is uh, next session of that course I'm teaching is Sunday, September 4th, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So that that course is coming to an end. Uh, when you register for our new course that starts up Thursday, September 8th, uh, you'll be able to join us in the Sunday class, okay, for the for the section that's coming to an end. And we do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch them anytime, okay? So a year from now, two years from now, you'll be able to go back and watch the entire course. You don't have to be present in the class because as soon as the class is over with, as soon as we complete a session, uh, within about 10 minutes or so, it's available on demand. So you can log it. You'll be able to log into your account and you'll be able to watch the full class. OK, so visit our uh, our new website, the African History Network dot com, the African History Network dot com. If you go to the old website, African History Network dot com, it will redirect you to the new one. And we also have a bundle pack so you can register for both classes that I teach for one hundred thirty dollars. That's over a, that's over a three hundred dollar value. Uh, if you've taken any of my online classes in the past, email us and you'll get a 50 percent discount. You can email us through the through the uh, website. OK. Also, uh, just click on uh, contact. Uh, what does it say? Contact the African History Network. Just email. Uh, click there and you can email us. The second class I teach and it's going to start up uh, Tuesday, September 13th, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power. 1865 to 1968 from the civil war to the civil rights movement and black power 1865 to 1968 and we go through and um we look at history starting in 1803 with the louisiana purchase okay and the haitian revolution because those two events are connected and uh we go through and look at history chronologically and see what leads up to the civil war taking place and look at the civil war reconstruction um 1860 1877 reconstruction era jim crow era great migration world war world war one world war two civil rights movement black power movement to understand what happened to us after slavery ended what were the laws and policies put in place to put us in the predicament we're in today to understand where we need to go from here okay so that's uh the second class um as well from the civil war to the civil rights movement and black power 1865 to 1968 Okay, now, so we'll look at things like why is Christmas celebrated on December 25th? Uh, this may go outside the circumference of some people's awareness, but nowhere in the biblical text does it state that Jesus the Christ or Yeshua was born on December 25th. And we, and we know the letter J didn't exist until 1630 AD also. Okay, so uh, we'll look at this history. We'll look at uh, uh, some things, some uh, aspects of the film black panther because the film black panther relates to african history african culture african language african spiritual systems we know the the panther deity in the film black panther bast comes from bastet who was a netter uh she was a goddess uh, worshipped in uh ancient kemet uh, around 2890 bc and uh, she was a originally in the form of a lioness, uh, had the head of a lioness originally and later the head of a cat, Bastet. OK, this is where Bast comes from in the film Black Panther. And also, you know, we'll look at things like the word Wakanda, because the word Wakanda is a real word. And uh, Wakanda is a, is a word, but it's also in the Omaha Ponca and Sioux Indian languages. OK, so we see it in uh, Bantu languages like uh, Key Congo, uh, and it's in reference to family, but also it's in the Omaha Ponca and Sioux Indian Native American languages. And Wakanda means possesses secret powers, possesses secret powers, which sounds a lot like uh, black girl magic to me. In Wisconsin, there's a Wakanda water park. 
a Wakanda water park uh, in Wisconsin. It's spelled W-A-K-A-N-D-A. It's been there for decades. Okay, it didn't just come into existence when the movie came out in 2018. Uh, we'll talk about Hannibal Barca and the Carthaginians and the Punic Wars, the three Punic Wars as well, and the fight against Rome and uh, uh, Publius Cornelius Scipio Africanus. We'll deal with the fact that Africa is not named after Publius Cornelius Scipio Africanus. People have it backwards. He took his surname after the Battle of Zama in 202 BC, after he conquers uh, Hannibal Barca. And uh, Africanus means belonging to Africa. Africanus is Latin. It means belonging to Africa. So we'll, we'll look at uh, Carthage uh, some as well. Uh, we'll look at Carthage. Uh, we'll look at the kingdom of Great Zimbabwe. Uh, we'll look at the three great West African kingdoms of Ghana, Songhai, and Mali. Uh, Axum as well. So we'll look at these different civilizations, these different empires. Um, we'll go through and, and look at some of the history of the um, Africans known as the Moors and, and going into uh, the Iberian Peninsula and settling in the southern portion of Spain that they call Al-Andalus, okay, and they go on in 711 AD, uh, and we'll look at Tariq ibn Ziyad uh, as well, who is going to uh, uh, lead his troops in 711, and where they land, the Iberian Peninsula, they land at a rock promontory, um, and they call it Jebel Tariq, Jebel Tariq, which in Arabic means Tariq, it, it means Tariq's mountain, Jebel Tariq, translation is Tariq's mountain. Um, and this is where Gibraltar comes from, okay? Gibraltar, that word Gibraltar comes from Jebel Tariq. So when you hear the rock of Gibraltar, this is something named after an African man. It's named after Tariq Ibn Ziyad, okay? Um, and we're going to see that uh, Tariq, uh, also goes on into the Texas Calvary into the Spanish city of Toledo. Uh, and with month, and within a month's time, Tariq Ibn Ziyad had effectively terminated European dominance of the uh, Iberian Peninsula. Okay. And we're going to see him go into Toledo and some other uh, uh, cities there as well and to conquer. All right. Now, Um, we deal with St. Maurice also. We look at uh, Mansa Musa, the, uh, becomes emperor of the Mali Empire in 1312 AD. Uh, we look at the three great West African kingdoms of Ghana, Songhai, and Mali also. Uh, Christopher Columbus. Columbus is crucial to understanding the expansion of the transatlantic slave trade and what Columbus went on his four voyages, what was behind his voyage uh, as well, and the atrocities that he inflicted upon indigenous people. So he never comes to the land that we call the United States of America. The closest he comes here is Cuba, which is 90 miles away, okay? But the the these island nations that he conquers, they still have not recovered from what happened to them over 500 years ago. Okay, uh, Hispaniola, the island of Hispaniola, the western third of Hispaniola is where Haiti is. But Puerto Rico and Honduras and Panama and Jamaica, things like this. And this, uh, these are all conquered by Spain. And there's going to be a fight. There's going to be a fight uh, between these European nations over these different new territories and island nations that are being conquered by Spain. Uh, so we're going to see Jamaica fall into the hands of the British. We see uh, the western third of the island of Hispaniola, St. Dominique, uh, is where Haiti is going to be. We see that fall into the hands of the French. So we're going to see these fights, the, these same European nations and these same Europeans who've been fighting over fighting each other for hundreds of years, going back to where, uh, going back to when they were groups of barbarians. Like the Anglo's, the Saxons, the Jutes, the Lombards, the Picts, the Allens, the Franks, the Vandals, the Visigoths, things like this. Going back to when they were barbarians, we're going to see these nations of Europeans continue to fight and kill one another. Okay. And they're fighting and killing each other over these new lands that are being conquered and they're fighting over wealth and 
um, they're um, setting up uh, plantations, especially sugarcane plantations in these uh, areas with a very warm climate. All right. So and then we look at the uh, so we look at what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. We look at Christopher Columbus, Ptolemy de las Casas as well. Ptolemy de las Casas estimates that Columbus was responsible for the murder of 12 million to 25 million indigenous people. OK, uh, so this is just a brief overview of this, uh, what's going to be an eight week online course ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, where they didn't teach you in school. I've been, te I've been teaching this class on and off for, since 2017, it's evolved immensely. It's evolved greatly from when I first taught it in 2017. So we have over 50 articles in the class. We, there's a, a number of books that we reference. You don't have to buy any of the books to follow, follow along in class. There's, um, about 150 slides or so um, in the class as well. There are also video clips. Uh, we look at what was the transatlantic slave trade and go through and look at this step by step. Um, the widespread enslavement of diverse peoples of economic and political gain has played a fundamental role throughout human history in the development of nations, nations ancient Greek and Roman societies operated by using slave labor, as did many European countries in the modern period. As early as the Middle Ages, Mediterranean cities were supplied with Moorish black slaves from Muslim countries in North Africa. Okay, by comparing the slave trade, by comparison, the slave trade is a term which has grown to be associated specifically with the transatlantic slave trade or the triangular trade that spanned four centuries, roughly 1518 to 1865. But really, it goes back to starts. We have to start in 1441 with the Portuguese because the Portuguese were going to dominate for the first 200 years. 1518 is when the Asiento de Negros is signed by King Charles V of Spain and is drastically going to expand the transatlantic slave trade. Um, okay, triangular trade that spanned for centuries, roughly beginning 1518 and 1865, involved three continents, Europe, Africa, and the Americas, and was responsible for human suffering on an unprecedented uh, scale. And we see that African slaves were first brought to the New World shortly after its conquering by Christopher Columbus. Um, and we see that uh, right around 1501, the Spanish are going to start bringing Africans into these territories, okay, like Hispaniola. Uh, however, the slave trade proper only began in 1518, many sources say when the first black cargo direct from Africa landed in the West Indies, and that's going to be under the control of the Spanish, and that's after the Asiento de Negros is signed. Now, the importation of African slaves to work in the Americas was the inspiration of the Spanish bishop, Ptolemy de las Casas, whose support of African slavery was motivated by humanitarian concerns, motivated by humanitarian concerns. But Ptolemy de las Casas argued that the enslavement of Africans and even some whites, proving that in the early period, slavery did not operate according to exclusive racial demarcations. They were still enslaving some Europeans, but they're going to increasingly shift over to African people. Um, Bartholomew de Casas argued that the enslavement of Africans and even some whites would save the indigenous American Indians or, or Amerindian populations, which were not only dying out, but engaging in large scale resistance as they opposed their excessively harsh conditions. As a result, King Charles V of Spain agreed to the Asiento or slave trading license of 1518, which later represented the most coveted prize in European wars as it gave to those who possessed it a monopoly in slave trading. Okay. So um, we'll go through and look at this history also. 
So this is a deep, deep course. Um, this is an eight-week online course that I teach. Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. We'll look at thousands of years of history. What we'll leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. We'll look at this history chronologically, okay? So you can register for this online course right now. So class number one starts Thursday, September 8th, 2022. This bonus content you can start watching now. It's going to be 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. And we have the uh, link to register for the class here in the thread of the broadcast also. I'm going to post the link here uh, again on the thread of the broadcast. And it's also in the description here as well. And at our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. So the class is regularly $130. is on sale $80. You can use this information with your children. I would say the content is PG-13, okay? Uh, it's not overly graphic. I don't do a lot of cursing, things like that. And you can watch from around the world also. So how do you all like this type of information? Okay, give us give us a thumbs up. Give us a heart. Give us a like. Uh, and when you register for this class, it also helps support the African History Network. Helps us keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting, pay some of the bills, etc. You can also support us through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN Show, through Cash App and through PayPal paypal.me forward slash the ahn show this helps us keep doing the research stay on the air pay some of the bills because it takes a lot to do all of this to do what i do uh we have the uh, paypal and cash app information on uh, our website as well in the link right here the cash app takes you to the um cash app barcode as well okay uh this is our only cash app account there's some fake app. There's some fake African History Network Cash App accounts. I'm still trying to get shut down. I've had Cash App launch an investigation. I have to follow with them on this. But this is our Cash App account. Dollar sign the AHN show S H O W. When you go to it, it says Michael and shows my picture there. Um, so these other ones are, are are fake ones. That's not us. And we have the PayPal um, link there also. All right, look, we have to get out of here. Uh, hopefully you, you learned a lot from this broadcast uh, and you can join us in class uh, as well. Uh, my radio show is on Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, the African History Network show on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation WFDF. We also broadcast here on Facebook and YouTube when I'm on live as well, okay? Uh, so the African History Network on Facebook and Michael M. Hotep on YouTube. Turn on live notifications so you know when we go live. And be sure to register for uh, our email newsletter. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, the 22828 to sign up for our email newsletter. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, the 22828 to sign up for our, for our email newsletter also. Okay, because uh, we send one out a few times a week and... We uh, try to send one out before uh, our shows and uh, before the uh, we teach the classes also. Okay, so text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, the 22828 to sign up for our email newsletter. Okay, look, we have to get out of here. Remember that at the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world because right now it's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. Wakanda forever, and we'll talk to you next time. Peace. Hotep, everybody. Hey, this is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecturer, writer, and historian. And I want to give a special shout out to everybody who has attended the 11th annual Liberated Minds Black Homeschool and Education Expo. I just want to take a few minutes, and uh, we had a great presentation that I did uh, on Saturday. So I teach two online history classes. Uh, one on Saturday and uh, one on Sunday. On Saturday, the class that I teach, normally 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, is called Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, 
understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. And this is normally a 10 week online class. We deal with thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. We can't start studying our history and slavery. Even when we study the transatlantic slave trade, which is important to study, we can't start in 1619 or in the 1440s with the Portuguese, when the Portuguese get involved in the transatlantic slave trade, we have to understand the history chronologically and deal with the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors who enter into the Iberian Peninsula today known as Spain and Portugal from North Africa in 711 AD. When we discuss the transatlantic slave trade, we have to first understand that African people are the original people of North, Central and South America and have been in the land we call the United States at least 51,700 years. Now, the second class I teach is on Sundays, normally 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's called uh, From the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. Now, these classes are normally $130 and on sale right now, $60. We do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded so you can go back and watch it any time. So a year from now, two years from now, you can go back and watch the entire class. Uh, with both of these classes, I would say the content is PG-13. So you can use this with your children as well if you want to. Um, also, you can advertise with the African History Network. We have three new advertising packages. A current promotion is buy one month to get one month free. We have a million followers at our Facebook fan page, the African History Network. And with our platinum package, um, we'll take our ads on our Facebook fan page uh, for you as well to um, help maximize your advertising campaign. And we take your 30 second and 60 second commercial we put into the rebroadcast uh, of our shows and also into the audio podcast of our shows as well uh we only have 20 advertising slots because we have a finite amount of advertising space uh email us at ahn show at the african history network.com ahn show at the african history network.com or call us 313-462-0003 all right right now is correct wrong behavior it's not over till we win wakanda forever and we'll talk to you soon peace hello african history network family You've put it off for way too long. Now it's time to act for your family, your future, and the next generation. Get life insurance for that peace of mind and security for you and your loved ones. Build your financial foundations starting today. Your independent agent at Fortify Trust Life Brokers with over a dozen strong a rated life insurance companies to offer you the life protection you need when it comes to final expense, term life, whole life, mortgage protection, annuities, and more. They're currently licensed in Alabama, Georgia, and South Carolina. Don't let a pre existing health condition hinder you from getting life insurance. You can get the affordable coverage you need today. Life insurance is only the beginning. Email them at Fortify Trust Life for a free fact sheet explaining the five basic building blocks for a strong financial foundation. It's their gift to you to help you fortify your future. Email them at FortifyTL828 at yahoo.com or call them at 706 339 5096 and leave a message fortify your future